So what we're finding in South Africa, I think there are two points of departure. The first one is in a lot of countries, especially in the global north, there's this idea that the just transition mustn't leave anyone behind. In the South African context where we've got so much poverty and inequality and unemployment, um, there are a lot of people who see the just transition as a meaningful process by which to actually improve the lives of people as opposed to just not leaving them behind. So the concept of justice is, is crucial and central to how we think about it in South Africa. In terms of the timing, we're finding a lot of pressure from the, uh, for the research community in South Africa to move from the stratospheric, here's a new way of looking at the world um, and conceptual and, and, and theoretical thinking to say the just transition needs to actually get traction on the ground immediately. And so we need to start learning by doing and looking at actual projects and saying how are these going to then fold up into our theoretical thinking and our policy making. So this is based on the work that Gaylor has been doing on how we think about a just transition at a more granular level. Um, and the thinking basically is that we can think of it in terms of three dimensions. The first one is procedural, which Lisa has spoken about, and that is the focus on an inclusive process um, and making sure that the people who will be impacted by the just transition actually have a voice in what their future looks like. Then there's distributive justice, which is where the focus is, which is essentially ideas of how you can create alternative um, decent jobs, how you can do retraining. But the core of the issue is basically who is going to pay for just transition activities, who are going to be the beneficiaries, and how are we going to understand and measure the impacts in terms of the lives of those beneficiaries. And then the third dimension, which we are finding very prominent in the projects in South Africa at the moment, and I'll come back to this, is the idea of restorative justice, which basically says that we've got to look at the past, present, and the future damages that have occurred against communities, workers, individuals, and the environment. And how do we take that into account going forward? So where we found Gaylor's research and his team's work particularly useful in the very complex South African socioeconomic um, territory is this idea that within those three dimensions of a just transition, you can have differing levels of ambition. So let me just take the first one, for example. If you were looking at procedural justice, you could run a very, very simple inclusive process where you have one workshop and you get the feedback from the community and you feed that into your project process. A more ambitious approach to that dimension might be to say, what resources, information, inputs can we provide to people on the ground to capacitate and empower and allow them to have a more meaningful voice in what their futures look like and how can we elevate them during that process. So what the work tells us is on the left, we can basically have a range of ambitions in terms of the just transition. You can either want to maintain the status quo and essentially have no ambition for a just transition at all, or you could be right at the top here in a transformational um, view where you say we need to fundamentally change the economic structure and the socioeconomic development trajectory of a country. And obviously there's a range in between. Now, embracing this idea of a just transition is incredibly useful from a practical perspective because it allows us to have movement and make progress even while people are having the debate of what is a just transition. So it allows us to make progress. So what we've done in terms of understanding just transition projects in the South African context and what we're thinking about um, is basically we said, if we're going to look at projects, 
um, it needs to be place-based. Um, and we've based our analysis on Mpumalanga, which is where the majority of the coal-fired um, electricity power plants and coal mines are in South Africa and where the just energy transition is focused. And the idea very much there is we will use the just energy transition as a learning experience that we can then apply to other sectors and other geographic areas. We found that there are huge and very vast number of project drivers in the just transition space. Um, from all tiers of government, to the private sector, to research institutions, and we're finding a lot of special purpose vehicles that are being designed specifically to experiment around these kinds of projects. Obviously, the definition of what is a just transition project is a major challenge for all of us. So in this initial early work, we have accepted the self-identification of the project champion to say, yes, this is a just transition project, and we're accepting that definition. We're definitely excluding fossil fuel and brown projects, but we're including not only green economy projects, but non-green projects that are not brown, but that allow economic diversification. And what we're doing, which I feel is, is very useful, is we're starting to create an evidence base. Instead of just looking at the just transition conceptually and theoretically, we're collecting commercial, financial and social information from these projects. Um, and we can learn from these and, and filter this up to how we think about policy. Um, so what we've done is we've come up with a very simplistic model about where we can place just transition projects to understand their overall nature and characteristics. So on the horizontal axis, we're basically saying you can go on the left from a low just transition ambition project, which would be, say, just creating decent jobs. And on the right hand side, we could say you could be very ambitious in terms of the just transition and you could want to create jobs, new livelihoods for the broader community, you can reskill and retrain workers, you can increase access to services, you can have increased asset ownership, you can rehabilitate the environment, so all of those good things. And on the vertical axis, we have put basically the amount of money you need invested in the project, because obviously a lot of these projects struggle to attract funding. So that basically gives you four quadrants where on the top right here, you have high value projects that are highly ambitious. And in the bottom left here, you have much lower budgeted projects um, that are less ambitious. And you can obviously have all the options in between. So what we did is we took our project sample and we were very surprised that we actually found four very neat clusters of projects. So we found very high value projects which had relatively low uh, just transition ambitions. So these, for example, were the repowering and repurposing of coal-fired power plants. They were only going to create um, job opportunities and, and weren't dealing with, with some of the other more ambitious elements. Um, but they were very attractive to the financial sector because of their high um, prices. Then we had, for example, something like Cluster 3, which is a small project for community beehives based on rehabilitating mine land that would create a lot of jobs and assets for women in marginalized communities. Now, when we saw these four clusters, we thought we had to have a view about the clusters. And um, we feel that these three points are particularly important. The first one is that all of these projects are important to providing a just transition going forward. And we can't give preference to high ambition projects because we're going to need all four types of projects to get the kind of economic growth, um, GHG reduction, um, and just transition that we're looking for. The second point we make is that even if a project in and of itself is not highly ambitious in terms of a just transition, 
it can open up downstream activities and opportunities which will become more ambitious and very important in terms of socioeconomic development. So we mustn't judge projects um, just because they initially don't necessarily have high ambitions. And then the third thing we notice is that an awful lot of these just transition projects are highly interdependent on other projects. And we find very few small standalone projects. And that's going to become very challenging in terms of how we design projects, how we look after the project cycle, and specifically how we finance them. So uh, this is my last slide, and it's just some very broad level characteristics of the projects that we've seen. The first thing is we found that almost all the Just Transition projects are based on some kind of novel technology. Um, and the technology tends to be untested and not have a track record. Often there are multiple technologies that need to be implemented simultaneously. And that is all extremely challenging, especially in the financing um, arena. And it means that the majority of projects are going to need a lot of piloting and we're going to need really good skills in terms of scaling and replicability. The other thing we're finding is that a lot of these technology-based projects do not have an existing enabling economic and regulatory environment. And so there's going to have to be a lot of work on policy and commissions to allow these projects to actually occur on the ground. In terms of sector bias, and we've only got a sample of 26 projects in one um, area at the moment, we're finding that most of them are based on environmental restoration, on biodiversity and agriculture, and far fewer industrial and manufacturing projects than we were hoping to see. And this is something we're going to have to think about going forward in terms of the balance of sectors um, in the new economic trajectory. Then in terms of boundaries, we found some very interesting and challenging characteristics. Because most of the projects are, in, are environmentally driven, we find that the unit of analysis for an environmental project is the natural system level as opposed to a municipal politically drawn boundary. So some of the projects are looking at a water table um, or looking at an entire watershed um, and, and the water system. So it goes across provinces and across municipal districts. That means a lot of these projects are going to have stakeholders and beneficiaries that are greater than the original target market, and we're going to have to figure out how to deal with that. And then finally, just some notes on the financial characteristics and challenges of these just transition projects. As I was saying, we are seeing suites of projects that have five or six sub projects and all the sub projects have different financing needs. So to get a just transition outcome, we're going to have to find a way to collectively meet all of those very different financial needs with one process. The second thing we're seeing is because of the complexity of these projects and because of who is driving these projects, we believe that the financial sector is going to need to have to get involved in the project development cycle earlier than they traditionally do. Traditionally, you have a project, you get it to bankable feasibility stage, and then you go to the market and you see who will give you what deal. What we're finding in the just transition space um, is that we're going to need the financial sector to help make deals rather than buy complete deals. Um, and they're going to have to offer a lot more technical assistance and get involved a lot earlier. And then the other thing we're finding is that we're going to need fundamentally different risk assessment frameworks. Um, we're going to have parties to these transactions who are not traditional parties and don't have track records. We're going to have to seriously elevate our understanding and our techniques in terms of pricing technology risk. We're going to have to learn new models of risking, of pooling risk. 
Um, and we're going to have to learn to not cherry pick projects that have the highest returns um, and leave the rest of the suite untaken care of. So these are some of the higher level or MISO level challenges. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what our practitioners are going to tell us in terms of how they're addressing these at a more specific project level.